So welcome everyone. Um, I'm Lee Harris, co-founder of Trading Research Group. We'll get into introductions of other parties on the call shortly. Always fun to do these kind of ad hoc special public events, um, especially when we're doing big picture emotive topics like is trading gambling? And if you've traded for any amount of time, you've, you've probably you've probably heard words to this effect from people who are aware of what you're doing, but not that aware of trading. And gambling is a really emotive thing. My grandfather um, was actually a bookmaker, an on-course bookmaker. Um, so in the, well, what would it have been, late 40s, 50s, um, he was an on-course, on-track bookmaker at horse racing events in the UK and dog racing meets. And then in the 50s and 60s, he had a, a betting shop. And when he was doing the on-course stuff, uh, my father balanced the book. And it was drilled into me as a kid, never gamble. You know, Lee, never gamble, never gamble, which is a bit odd coming from bookmaker who was making his money from gambling. The way bookmakers make their money is all of the possible outcomes on events they put a margin on. So let's say there are, let's take a soccer match where, you know, it's team A will win, team B will win, or it's a draw. And if it was equal probability for all of those outcomes, you know, it's 33.3%. Um, they will actually price the odds to add up to more than 100%. So that's their margin. Um, so that's how they make their money. So bookmakers in the long run, theoretically, should never lose money. Although I can think of at least one famous you know, well-known casino operator who went bankrupt a few times. Um, but bizarrely, my, my grandfather, even though he was – running a business where in the long run you make money, whatever happens, he was so miserable if ever he had a day where he lost money due to not balancing the book or an unexpected outcome. But anyhow, as a kid, it was always drilled into me, never gamble, never gamble. And it, it's really emotive. Um, so it's going to be fun to walk through today's session where we think about and use some examples to, you know, is trading gambling? And then there's a subtext. If it is, how can we exploit some of these characteristics to our advantage? So that, that's going to be the fun point. And I'm going to make it um, as interactive as I can today. So we can use the chat, um, but also hopefully if Zoom does its thing, got some interactive back and forth, which we can do. So who's here today? Well, I am. I'm this uh, handsome guy in the middle here. I'm Lee Harris. I'm co-founder of Trading Research Group. I've also got a trading tools business called Emoji Trading. We've also got various participants from Trading Research Group with us. So in some of the chats before we kicked off, you'll have heard Jeff Mayhem, who is my other co-founder, and Jonathan Van Kloot, who is our community manager. Maybe you guys just want to say a quick hello in case we bring you in later. Hello, everybody. I'm Jonathan. Nice to see you all here. I'm Lee's co-founder, Jeff, and um, welcome, everyone. Marvellous. Thanks for that, guys. We've also got a mix of trading research group members. So this is our educational group where we do live meetings pretty much every weekday. Sometimes we trade the market. Sometimes it's more educational. And we've got, I see we've got some ex-members, some people taking a break from trading, and a bunch of students of our online education. And then there'll be other names who are just here as guests, which is marvellous. You know, welcome. Thanks for coming. We appreciate that. But I just don't want to talk to you one way. We're going to do some tests and um, kind of game playing during the session, which will be fun. But what I want to do is just get a bit of a sense as to who is here, because that way I can try to tailor what we're talking about um, as we go through the session. So I'm going to put up a couple of polls. Um, in Zoom, and we'll just take a few minutes to launch those and gather those, and we will see what we get. So the first one is, what do you trade? You should have had a poll slash quiz box pop up on your Zoom. And in here, there are two questions. If you can indicate what your main trading focus is, and then what you also or would also like to trade, that would be great. So we'll just take a couple of minutes to allow that to go, and then we'll share the results and we can understand who's who. So wow, this is amazing. I can see right now nine people of 30, 10 have participated. We need that Jeopardy music, JVC. Yes, we do. Are we locked out? I tried to click on these, and you just have the audience 
not the yeah it's just the yeah. audience and for okay. some of these actually i'm going to ask that our trading research group members don't participate because that's going to skew the results i'm really looking to understand you know for this i'm i'm, I'm less concerned but in you know, some of them where people have got a familiarity of these concepts we don't really want to skew the results okay we've got 20 of 30 66 percent participated we'll just see if anyone else is going to play this won't be shared publicly. I mean, the remaining seven people, you know, feel free to click. I wonder who hasn't. Not to worry. Okay. 21 of 29. So, okay, I think we will do that. So what I see is most people trade futures um, and also... We also trade or would like to trade stocks slash ETFs or options. I'm going to share those results. I think I can do that. There we go. Yes, that's really cool. We can see it. Nice. You can see that. And is that in what? In your poll quiz window, you can see the results? Yep. yep. Brilliant. Okay. So we can see that most people are primarily focused on futures. But aside from that, it's really stocks or options. Um, binary options, van contracts, Forex, not so interesting. So that's great. You know, we're, we're looking at sensible things in terms of people's interests. So future stocks and ETFs, and options. Okay, that's great. Let's try something else as well. Okay. Oh, a poll has been launched in this meeting. Why can't I launch this one? Oh, I'm struggling. You have to here. Do you have to there's stop a, it sharing first? Maybe? Yeah, there's a button there on stop sharing the existing poll. Maybe uh, that's it. Uh, yeah, well done. That was it, yeah. I, I needed the Microsoft Power Trainer there, didn't I? So, exactly. Okay, next poll. Let's get a sense of people's attitudes towards gambling. Do you or have you ever gambled? I mean, my grandfather said to me, never gamble, never gamble. But, you know, have done in the past. There's no no option. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, if you don't click on anything, that's sort yeah, of Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not surprisingly, poker and blackjack are leading the race. <laughs> yep. yeah. Sports, though, is quite popular here. It's interesting. It's good to get a sense of, you know, people's mindsets on this. So that's 16 of 28. This is this is every life choice is a gamble. Like, yeah, too right. Okay, so about half of everyone here has answered. So I'm going to assume. Let's share the results. So as Jeff said, no surprise. It's poker and blackjack. Sports is interesting. Uh, maybe I know we've got at least one person in TRG who has an interest in horses, owning them, breeding them. Um, Peter is saying, I shouldn't say I don't gamble, hate poker machines. Okay, so what's encouraging? No one has said anything that moves. Okay, not many people did roulette. So, where people have gambled, whether it's for fun or you know, a bit more interest, it's on it's on stuff, games where there is some degree of let's assess what's going on. Poker for sure. Um, you know, there's probability involved blackjack the same thing even sports or horse racing because you read the form or you, know, you do your research there's a degree of it being a considered bet whereas roulette is totally random game so okay that's interesting uh let's end that one and then the final thing that we will do is let's answer the big question Is trading gambling? Now, everyone should have an opinion on this. It's complicated. It's perfect. It's like relationships. Yeah. Be interesting as well. I mean, you know, how many people have just encountered that, you know, in social or family conversations you know how was your trading well it's gambling isn't it i've had that so many times uh, peter saying he feels futures 
I feel futures are enough if you call that gambling close enough, not interested in fun like horse racing. Yeah, yeah, totally. I've been trading 50 years. I've said this to you guys before. My sister still doesn't understand it and thinks I'm gambling. <laughs> and you, know, you just can't explain it after a while. You should sell her that committing time to writing a screenplay is more of a gamble. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Her odds are much lower than mine, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Although the upside on a hit there is much bigger. You know? Yeah. Okay. So in these results, which are most people, 61%, have said it's complicated. Okay. Good. Um, 3%, oh, sorry, 3, 13% have said yes. Six people have said no. Interesting. So I think, you know, in the main, what we've seen is people regard this as a nuanced question. Um, and I also think it is fair to say that, you know, this idea of gambling is an emotive thing. For whatever reason, gambling, because of, you know, downsides to it, addiction, losses, this kind of thing, is a quite a negative, um, it, it's got a negative connotation to it. And I think as traders, that's probably why we are a little bit prickly or we find it a, a non-binary question to answer is trading gambling. That's what we'll go into. Okay. So let's get into this now. We've got a sense of who's who and what people trade, what they trade as a secondary item, what they'd like to trade, and people's experience of and attitude towards gambling. So that's good. What we're going to do now, um, we're going to play a couple of games. Um, we'll launch the poll for the first one. So it's sitting there. Don't answer this yet. Uh, because it's going to be meaningless. Um, okay, so we're going to play a game. Here's the game. You're going to place a $10 bet. You've got a choice of two games that you can play. In game A, you've got a 90% chance of winning a dollar and a 10% chance of losing your stake, losing the $10. Or game B, you've got a 1% chance of winning $1,000. $1,000! Exclamation mark or a 99% chance of losing your stake. So with your $10, which game are you going to play? How many times do I get to play? <laughs> it's the, the rules are placed up here, JVC. Okay, so eight people have answered so far. This, yeah, this can be open to TRG people. So right now, most people are playing game A. We've got 12 people, 15, 16. I'd better write these results down as well. 21 people. So more people are answering this than some of the earlier questions. That's interesting, isn't it? 21 people have answered so far. Depends on how much you drink. Oh, dear. Calvin saying, don't attempt to explain it. It's trading damage to people who fly. Exactly right. Okay, so 71%, 71% game A. Okay, that's good. Now I'm going to do the same thing again. We're going to keep playing this game. Let's launch the quiz. This time, you've got $1,000 and you're going to place $10 bets on the same get two games and you can play either game A or game B. Same chances. So with your $1,000 bankroll, of which you're going to place $10 bets, which game are you going to play? Hey, people still like game A in the main. That's interesting. Now, 21 people voted last time. <laughs> if, if 21 people don't vote this time, something really weird is going on. So it's looking pretty similar. 19 people have voted. This is not the game, it's a gold mine. <laughs> okay, 21 people have voted. And okay, this time round, one more person, 16 rather than 15, have gone for game A. So it was 15 last time, it was 16 this time. And that is 76% versus 71%. And I'm going to end that and share the results so that you can see there's no sleight of hand going on. Okay, interesting stuff. Now, in the chat, I'm interested to hear people's reasons for their choice. And if you put in the chat either A or B, depending on what you voted for, put that down and put your reason. 
And I'm going to I'm going to second guess and preempt some of the the reasons that had come back. I think game A, people's attitude is going to be, I I like the idea of a sure thing. I, I don't care about the size of the win. I want the sure thing. Um, people that went for game B, they're probably thinking, hell, it's only ten bucks. I don't care about losing ten bucks for the chance to win a thousand. Look at my risk reward ratio. Uh, I imagine it's that kind of thing. Um, Alex is saying I wouldn't play the game the last ten dollars. Okay. Um, Peter saying you see odds on game A and you get that. Alex would buy a beer instead. Um, Roman saying it's not a game; it's a gold mine. Twenty-four percent put for one percent. No logic there. Okay, so um, in the main, people went with game A, the sure thing, what's seemingly the safe bet. Yeah. This is where it gets interesting. Let's actually have a look at the the expectancy seemed better in game B. Okay, Renault, you're on a good path. Anita's saying she plays the lottery every month and the odds are even lower. Um Okay, what did you? What game did you go for in Easter? I'm assuming game A. Um, that was the majority of people. Even now, I'm, I'm following the odds. Um, Alfredo, I'm each case you lose. Okay, here's the thing. Let's look at the value of each game. Yeah, in game A, you've got a ninety percent chance of winning one dollar and a ten percent chance of losing ten dollars. So if we look at the value of the win multiplied by its probability, and subtract the value of the loss, actually, game A is a net losing game. So $1 multiplied by 90% is 90 cents. $10 multiplied by 10% lose a dollar. In the long run, game A loses 10 cents. Game B, however, the win is 1% of $1,000, has a value of $10, 99% chance of losing $10 is minus $9.90. The long-term expected value of game B is positive. So a lot depends here on are you placing your only bet with your last $10, in which case game A would be safer. Yeah, because it is more likely turn to turn to get your win. But if you have your $1,000 bankroll, if you keep playing game A, placing $10 bets, you're going to end up very slowly eroding your bankroll. It's going to go up and down, up and down. But because it has what we will call negative expectancy, the long-term value of the game is negative, you'll lose money. And it might seem a bit counterintuitive, but if you've got $1,000 in your bankroll, and you're going to place $10 bets, and the outcome of each next play is totally independent of the previous outcome, you will actually make money in the long run playing game B. So you would, you know, all things being equal, you would expect one play of game B out of 100 to give you the win. So even if you lose 99 times, you still have that chance. Of being positive, and a lot depends. And this is what's known as the Monte Carlo simulation: the order of, of events occurring. Counterintuitively to most people, game B is long term more profitable, even though the chances of any one game giving you the win are much much lower. And this is the key principle called expectancy that we're going to get into now. So. Psychologically, people like a sure thing, yeah? And people are really bad at calculating expected value. Uh, They also, I know it's gambler's fallacy, they also have this view. uh, No, Roman, I said for the second game, yeah? The first game, I said you're going to place a $10 bet. Second game, I said you have $1,000 with which to place $10 bets. So people also have this view that events must be connected. You know, if I flip a coin and I keep flipping a coin, if it comes up heads 10 times in a row, it must be more likely 
after 10 heads to come up tails. Well, why? Flipping a coin is a totally independent event. Yep, the outcome of the next flip has no relationship to the previous flip. And yet people, it's human nature, we seem to say, well, if this has happened so many times, it must change. And this is the whole ethos, the reasoning, the business model behind casino games. Casino games have a built-in positive expectancy, the house edge. For the casino, there's a margin. That's why if you play roulette, yeah, you, you've got the zero and the double zero, which is where the house wins. It forfeits everything. So even though you appear to be getting you know, even odds on black or red, the fact is you've got the zero and the double zero on the roulette wheel. And this is how casinos, bookmakers, etc., make their money by understanding and exploiting expectancy. So I wanted to do that little survey. I just want to park the concept out there and you know, just illustrate to you that most people, yourselves included, um, have a kind of instinctive approach to assessing probability, expected value, and outcomes. So it gets interesting because once we're aware of this and we can calculate expectancy, expected value, we can look to see how maybe we can apply this to trading and take the same approach to trading that a casino would do to running their business or a bookmaker would do or a professional gambler who's looking to place value bets. And we'll get into this um, a bit more. But now let's continue and let's see, let's get a sense for how you trade. So uh, let's go to the polls. We're going to look at a couple of things. Firstly, let's understand the way in which you take trades. So there are two questions here. The first one is, why do you enter a trade? And there's really three options here. Is it about the entry point? Is it low risk? Or do you know the exact odds of where price is going to go when you're right and where it will go if you're wrong? Or is it something about chart patterns, your indicator has given a green arrow or something like that? Then the second question is looking at why do you exit? Is your take profit, take profit 15? Was that reached or did your stop get hit? Or a specific price that you were aiming for traded? Or maybe conditions changed and you hit flat? So we've got 17 responses so far. Interesting at the moment, um, we have a single choice question. Exactly the same number of people have said it's a low risk entry point have also said they know the exact odds of where price will go to if they're right and where it will go to if they're wrong. They know the exact odds. Why are you here? You should be delivering this presentation if you know the exact odds. So I'm interested to know how you calculate those odds. Um, four people, it's about a chart pattern or an indicator. Okay, 19 people have answered now. Uh, and then it seems to be most people exits because conditions changed. Okay, that's interesting. So very few people exit because take profit was reached or stop got hit or a specific price traded. So people are assessing conditions and then choosing to get out. Okay, let's just make a little note of this. So most people are low risk entry. Exact odds is 35%. And then exiting is about conditions changing. Okay, let's just share that so you can all see it. So that's interesting. So for those people who know the exact odds, just put something in the chat. We can even unmute you. Just explain in the chat briefly, how are you calculating these exact odds of where price will go to if you're right and where it will go to if you're wrong? Conditions changing is a reversal. Okay. So I'd like to hear from at least one person. Okay, stats, says Alfredo. Good. Um, not going to have you do this, JVC. So you're ready. Okay, great answer. It's in your feeling 
comet experience. So, Anita, did you say the entry is the exact odds? Peter is saying inflection point, volume traded, got a run on the opposite. Okay, so Anita is saying she knows the exact odds based upon feeling, comma, experience. Okay. Barr is saying stats. Okay. Okay, that's useful. Best choice of the three. Okay. <laughs> it would have been a mess if we'd done a free text thing. Okay. Uh, so maybe we could have, we should have uh, made that a little bit looser. I, you know, I, I know approximate likelihood, that kind of thing. Uh, that might have been a cleaner way of doing it. And then the final uh, bit of data, which once again, and this is really important when we trade, let's get a sense for risk management. How do you manage risk? Is it risk reward ratio? I never take a trade that has less than a three to one risk reward ratio. My take profits 15 ticks. My stop loss is five. I can't lose. Or do you work on a fixed stop? Back two candles, one tick beyond the wick. Or you have a predetermined place where you know you're wrong. Now, looking at these answers coming in, this is in the main TRG students and members because they have a predetermined place where they know they're wrong. One person is risk reward ratio. Okay. Two people are fixed stop, whether it's ticks, points, dollar value, previous candle. I'm the prop firm I was in. I mean, e even there, one of the coaches, he always used to say fixed monetary stop. And if you trade one lot, then, you know, one, one lot is 16 ticks, two lots is eight ticks. Four lots is two tick stops. Even there, you know, they're being coached on fixed stops. Okay, but in the main, and I think this is down to TRG education, people have got a predetermined place where they know they are wrong. That is encouraging. So that was useful. Thanks, to everybody, for answering that. Uh, <laughs> Calvin gets out when he blows his evaluation account. Okay, kind of a fixed stop. That's a... Two and a half thousand dollar drawdown stop. Yep. <laughs> Fine. So, in the main, people are entering because it's a low risk entry, um, or they have a sense of the likelihood of what they're looking to happen happen and what they're looking to not happen happen. So, a kind of looking at the value of what's going on. And then they're determining risk and exiting on conditions changing and they have a predetermined place where they're going to get out which i would assume relates to this is where the idea is invalidated and i have got an idea of the likelihood of the idea being invalidated so this is encouraging the key point here is do these setups do these trades that you take or the specific framework for these trade setups have evidence of positive expectancy are you able to look at these setups just like game a game b yep one percent chance of winning a thousand dollars and in the long run can you actually quantify that if you were to do the exact same thing every time whenever it occurs it is net positive now if it comes down to feel yeah if it's feel slightly less tangible experience, something that is my instinct, I know it when I see it. Yeah, it may work again and again and again, but you do have some danger that without actually, without actually having a qualified numeric view of what's going on, your position sizing can be wrong. You can get blindsided by, you know, black swan event. Um, you can go on tilt. And, you know, I must be right because it felt right. It felt right. It still feels right. It's even better here. It's even better here. Oh, bugger. I've been run over. Yeah. So without evidence of positive expectancy that we get from analyzing the stats on particular setups, there is always a risk that the human and the elements of discretion are going to cause us to trip over or in Calvin's case, 
uh, blows valuation account. So I'm a big advocate of define an approach to trading and trade setups where the likelihood, the probability is there in black and white through the data. And this is where the idea of you know, card counting in blackjack, it's doing the same thing. Card counting works in blackjack because as the deck of cards is dealt through and eroded, presuming it's a shoe dealt game rather than a continuous shuffler, in other words, the six decks, the cards get burnt, and then when they run out of cards, they put them all back in, they reshuffle, and they continue. As cards are played, and you see on the blackjack table the number of cards which have been played and what they are, aces, tens, fives, you have an idea of what is left in the deck. Therefore, you can calculate the probability of what's going on. So that's the kind of evidence which is really good to get in your trade setups because then you can exactly quantify the risk and you can quantify the likelihood of the trade working. And with that, you can determine if a given setup in the long term has got positive expectancy. So how can we get to a place where we find trade setups that have positive expectancy? Well, the market gives us some pretty clear and pretty orderly information. If we can start to analyze things like ranges based on time, you know, the, lots of retail traders will use arbitrary time periods on their chart, five minutes, 10 range, 15 minute, Bortic Renko, 83, probe and reverse, all this stuff. But these are all arbitrary and therefore wrong. Fact of the matter is, if we look at futures, CME futures, the Globex session opens at 5 p.m. Central. NYSE cash opens at 9.30 Eastern. Cash settles at um, 4 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Central, and the futures settle an hour later. So there is a structure. There's a time-based structure to the trading session, really driven by the cash markets, stock exchanges. And within that, we can start to look at ranges, like you know the overnight range on CME futures from 5 p.m. Central until the open of the cash at 8.30 Central. We can look at ranges like the first hour of regular trading hours, first hour of cash, if you trade equities. So that's known as the initial balance in market profile terminology. And the statistic, which we use quite a lot of the time, and TRG members are familiar with it, is we'll look at things like the initial balance, the first hour's range, on things like ES futures. And we know that pretty much the majority of days, about 98% of all trading days, the initial balance will be broken on at least one side. It remains unbroken. So in this diagram, the first hour's range is the two horizontal orange lines. It is very rare for ES to stay within the first hour's range um, on any given trading day. It's about 2% of all trading days when that happens. So 240, 260 trading days a year. It's four, five, six trading days a year where the first hour's range is not broken. It's about 65% of all days will break one side and only one side and 30-something percent will actually break one side and at some point in the day break the other side. So what we know are things like, on most days, this first hour's range is going to be broken. Um, most of those days, only one side of that range is going to be broken. So this starts to give us a framework in which we can put a probability of certain events happening. We can also go a little bit deeper. On the right, there's a little representation of uh, volume at price, so how many contracts or shares were aggressively bought on the right-hand side at any given price, and then on the left-hand side, um, how many were sold. And the green and red numbers are the net difference at each price level, called the delta, the delta at price. So as we start to look at the volume at price, so how many contracts or shares of traders at a given price level, there are also certain other patterns that we can see. And we can start to analyze frequency and the occurrence of those patterns. So it gives us another data point, another set of metrics, where we can see for a given 
traded instruments certain patterns within the volume how often do they occur or how often do they not occur or how often do they occur intraday but are no longer there by the end of the day so we've got quite a few things that we can start to look at in terms of how often does this occur how often does that occur and we can start to build those together and assemble them into trade setups based upon events that occur and the likelihood of those events occurring and the likelihood of it not occurring, which might be where we're wrong. And then we can start to combine these statistics into a framework of, I know the likelihood of this occurring. I know the likelihood of the opposite thing occurring or even something independent occurring, and I can combine them. And in this way, I can put an expected value and an expectancy on this trade setup. Now, that is how we can actually start to monetize these events. So here, same chart, you know, I've highlighted the area where this particular product, this is most likely ES, it is ES looking at the price axis. You can see on this chart, which looks like a five minute chart to me, it's broken out of the initial balance, the first hours range. Now, most retail traders, um, well, they'll, they'll do one of two, three, four things. They'll simply trade the breakouts. You know, they'll wait for the breakout. They will buy the breakout in this case. Okay, broke out to a new high. I'm going to buy it at the new high. And then it wiggles around and it goes back in. Maybe it stops them out or they will wait for the pullback to that level and then buy it. Some people will look to fade this range before it breaks. Professionals will always fade the edges. But in this case, we're looking at a range which we know breaks 98% of the time. And if we've established this range and it hasn't broken yet, then trying to place a bet on it not breaking, if you're fading it, is quite a high risk bet. Yeah, you may be able to catch a little bit out of it in the back and forth, but you are playing with fire here. You know, when we get to the edge of a range, which I know breaks 98% of the time, I'm going to trade against it breaking. Now, in TRG, we teach things like if I know this is going to break, how can I trade in the direction of the break? So go somewhere from the middle to the edge and maybe beyond. But we can do things like know that if this particular range breaks one side and only one side, about 65% of all days, well, we can do something with that because when it's broken, we have an idea of what's not going to trade. Yeah. If we only break one side of the range, 65% of days, at the moment it breaks, we know it's 35% likely to trade the other side. Yeah, we've broken, in this case, the high. And as 65% of days only break one side, it is more unlikely that it's going to trade the other side. And we can apply this to lots of things, time-based ranges, patterns in the volume at price, the order flow. And depending upon the event that we're looking at, we can look to monetize these events using various products. You can do it with futures, stocks, ETFs, which is actually a little bit more complicated. Um, or you can use kind of binary outcome products. You can use options, zero day to expiry options, or CME events contracts, which are binary options. Um, you've got exchanges like Nadex who create lots of binary options, event contracts, some even with two-hour expiries. So depending upon the nature of the event that you're able to spot, you can then look to monetize that event with a range of different trading products. What gets interesting as well, you'll hear people talk about you know, Monte Carlo simulation and you know on their back-tested setup, well, what happens if we change the running order of all of the trades? What's my risk of ruin? Is my bankroll big enough? But if we start to look at events based upon the structure of the market, then it gets to a point where actually on any given trading day, this whole Monte Carlo uh, simulation, you know, what if we change the running order, becomes much less applicable. Because during the trading day, if we're making our decisions based upon something that occurs at a certain point in time, it would be daft for us to go through all of our results intraday and shuffle up the order. Yeah, 
our trade decisions are actually predicated on something that occurs in a certain point in time. We might be looking at some statistics around the break of the first five minute range, and then maybe the first one hour range, and then maybe the range formed between 12 p.m. and 2 p.m. during lunch hour. Yeah. So if we were looking at a set of trades in our playbook based upon time based ranges that happen in sequence, it would be a bit daft to say, well, I need to consider the outcome of the lunchtime trade before I consider the outcome of the first hour trade just to check my bankroll supports it. It might even be that the events are actually connected. Maybe the way in which the range breaks at lunchtime is positively correlated to the way in which the first hour's range breaks. So we can start to get deeper into that kind of thing. But what is crucial is how much should we trade? What position size do we take? How much do we put at risk? And that's why I put the question up asking about risk management. And are you trading with a fixed loss, whether it's dollar amount, tick, where the extreme price of the candle, three candles back is? Because something we're able to do when we know the value of our setup and the value of it being right versus the value of it being wrong, we can apply that to our portfolio, our equity, and determine what is the optimal position size to actually trade with based upon the probabilities that exist within our trade setup. And it's probability of right and probability of being wrong. And these aren't necessarily connected probabilities. I might be looking to take a trade based upon a pattern in the volume at price, and that's my probability of being right. But my risk is based upon some time-based range. So we're not necessarily looking at the odds of this event happening are 70%, and therefore my odds of being wrong are 30%. It could be that I'm taking a particular trade setup, especially in futures, where I kind of have a non-binary outcome. The likelihood of the events occurring in my favor is maybe 85%, and the likelihood of it losing is 30% based upon two different things. But not only are there the probabilities, I can also think about the financial value of my gain and the financial value of my loss. And then I can put all of this into a melting pot and determine for how much I'm prepared to put at risk or how much I'm trying to make, then what is the optimal position size for this trade? And that you, you can calculate this in pen and paper, but it's very hard to do in the moment when you're trading. So this is where it gets really interesting, taking a very statistical, quant-based approach to your trade setups, because you get to a point where you can not only be trading setups that have positive expectancy, you can also be position sizing to the optimum level to, in reality, protect your trade equity, protect your account and not get oversized, but equally not be undersized and not be getting full value from your, let's call it your risk budget. And this is exactly why card counting works in casinos. In card, card counting, when you play blackjack, you're playing a game where there are known probabilities to the game. And then by keeping track of the cards that have left the deck and already been played, you can determine, based upon the probability of what is likely to occur, whether you should be increasing your bet size or not. And although you, you don't get much of an edge, you can actually reclaim the, the edge away from the casino. And that's the reason card counting works. You turn the game into positive expectancy on your own terms. And by looking at statistics in the right way, we can then turn trading into much the same thing. We can use elements of an approach to gambling and apply it to our trading and work in a way where we are eliminating feel, discretion, and turning it into something very quantitative, very mathematical. So I've preempted feedback. 
that's going to come here. I'm going to talk to this now, but uh, I'm interested as well. You know, if you feel free to put your own comments in the chat. A lot of the time when you trade in this way, you're going to find the sort of go, no go decision on any given trade will say, this trade actually does not have positive expectancy. And you might look at it and go, but this looks really good. And you know what? It might even happen. Yeah. But when you look at it purely statistically, it doesn't add up. So in a lot of cases, people go, but this rules out a lot of opportunities. Now, I regard every trade that you take is actually an opportunity to lose money. Yeah. Nobody has a hundred percent likelihood of winning a trade. Okay. If you've got infinite bankroll, you're trading a hundred thousand dollar accounts, you're trading one micro e mini. Yeah. Uh, $1.25 per stick. Um, you can take a lot of heat. Yeah. You could go thousand dollars off size to make two dollars fifty. Good for you. But as we don't have a hundred percent likelihood of winning every trade, um every by five on thirteen against dealer seven though, Peter. Um every trade in reality is an opportunity to lose money. Yeah. I recall a situation I was um, exploiting some matched sports betting promotions to the bookmaker, and I was in a betting shop, and the clerk didn't know how to process the bet. And the guy behind me was getting really agitated, and he wasn't able to put his bet on the next horse race. And he actually shouted at me and the clerk going, because of you, I wasn't able to put my bet on. And I turned to him and said, yeah, so I probably saved you from losing money. And it turned out his horse lost. Yeah. So a lot of gamblers will go into a bet only seeing the upside. They don't think about the loss or the risk. And in trading, if you're going to survive for the long term, you absolutely have to consider the risk and trade for tomorrow. It's about managing risk. So if a particular way of trading is preventing you from taking trades, which statistically in the long term would prove to have negative expectancy, this is a good thing. But maybe that's not fun. Well, you know, I, I'm going to wave the warning flag again and go, well, you know, trading can be enjoyable, but if, if there's a real buzz, if you're getting a dopamine hit every time you take a trade, your heart rate is accelerated. Yeah, well, I'm in trade. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Um, this is, you know, a warning sign, addiction. Yeah, slightly like turning into gambling. So... If your instinctive reaction to let's use the statistics, but they don't work all the time, I might not get all the possible winning trades. It's like that. I would ask you to have a close look at your approach to trading. And you may well be doing really well right now, but maybe every now and then you go on tilt. So maybe every now and then the system doesn't work and you have a big, big drawdown. That's why it's it's a lack of filtering for positive outcomes. Um Maybe you've seen this and you really like this approach. You go, well, will it work? My indicators, my MACD, my RSI, my Algo Box 9000 institutional trade-o-meter. Um, might do, might not. But fact is, you know, common technical analysis indicators are outdated now. Um, anything that is some mathematical calculation derived from price with a wavy line is outdated, may or may not work. What is unquestionable in terms of what happens in the market is there's a structure based upon the session times and there is volume traded at price and it's volume that results in price moving yeah if we constrain ourselves to those elements we are dealing with underived data and the problem with a lot of technical analysis indicators is they are derived from price they're clever formulas based on price they are always going to be behind and for as often as not, as some crossover or you know, wavy line has gone above 80, may or may not work in the modeling. It's not a true reflection of what is happening right now in the market. What is true is the market structure, the session times, and the volume that trades at every price. But Lee, I've back tested my system. I've gone on replay at half speed and I've followed my indicators and I've hit buy and I've hit sell. Well, you know what? This is not back testing. Back testing is being able to express your trade setup rules in some algorithmic or programmatic manner. If this, then this, 
and execute on it all the time. Oh, but I don't enter when it's FOMC day or this is happening. Okay, you've added an extra input to your system. Yeah. So what are the statistics like on that? And having written and experimented with lots and lots and lots and lots of trading algorithms, I can tell you anything based on simple technical analysis based indicators, wavy lines, rule sets does not work in the long term. You may have a good run, but trend following systems will get cut up when we're in ranging markets. Systems that that fade the edges of ranges will get cut up when we're trending. And unless you have been able to test in a 100% automated rule-based way, your system is going to blow up. This is irrespective of your win rate. It's irrespective of risk-reward. There is going to be a black swan event that it will not survive. Even worse, if you are running replay, acting as a human, using discretion, this is not back-testing a system. This is honing your pattern recognition as a human, polishing your discretion, but you are actually the risk point in terms of that execution. So I've backtested my system as an objection from you know most retail, retail traders on their TA wave lines going on on replay. Ah, you are not treating trading like card counting. You're practicing how quickly you can press buttons when you see things occur. So that's how you treat trading like card counting. But if you're actually going to get started in this way, what do you actually do? Well, what is crucial is you gather statistics. And our trading platforms are, you know, we've got all the data there in the trading platforms. What we have to do is wrestle with our trading platforms a little bit to extract the usable statistics from them. They could be volume at price base. They could be time-based ranges. If you really, 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 really want to, if you insist, you could do it on TA indicators. I don't. Um, but once you've got a set of statistics that look interesting and show potential of having positive expectancy, positive long-term edge, then you need to determine how do you monetize them? And also, how can you ensure that you win more than you lose? Just because we've got a particular setup doesn't mean it's financially viable in this particular moment in time based on the price of the contract that we're trading. Then we can look at combining events. You know, what happens if I see pattern XYZ in the volume at price after the first hour's range has broken? How do I combine these two independent events into a trade setup? And how do I use two separate inputs or more? to then determine my optimal position sizing right now. Once you've done that, you understand the mechanism of doing that, you can build a trading system that's got a statistical edge, positive long-term expectancy. You can then start to get your platform to constrain you, which is the risky element, dumb human, yeah, into how can I get my trading platform telling me to go or no go, or how can I automate this even better? And then once I've got that sitting there trading for me in a much better way than I do, because it's a machine that's following rules, how can I then develop my playbook with other things? So that's the process you need to go through in order to get started in trading in a very statistical-based quantitative way and turn your trading into an activity that's no different to playing blackjack and counting cards. So with this, there are two possible outcomes, maybe three. Um, One outcome is I'm already doing this. Brilliant. Good for you. Thanks for coming. Um, (laughs) uh, It might even be that you're going, but I trade this way and it's even better and I want to tell you all about it. That sometimes happens on these events and people tell us, but I use RSI 23 on my three-minute bars and that works brilliantly. Fantastic. You know, we'll, we'll nod our heads and give you that validation. Well, you might have heard this and go, oh, God, this sounds horrible. Um, This sounds like a lot of work. Sounds like it's going to eliminate um, a lot of the discretion and the fun parts of the activity of trading. It's not for me. Okay, it's good. Okay. Or it might be that you look at this and you go, okay, intrigued. Um, I like the idea of this. What do I do about it? So this is where I tell you what you can do about it. Um, Don't think we do a free session like this and we don't try to entice you to act on it, do you? So we are going to be running a course, 10-week course, 
starting on December the 16th, called the Card Counter's Guide to the Markets. It's a course that I've developed based upon these principles and based upon how my own trading has developed. And it's going to run for 10 weeks um, from September the 16th. Between now and then, I'm going to probably do little teaser sessions like this, but looking at different elements of what's on the course each Saturday. So we might look at some interesting stats. We might look at some particular setups and how they performed. We'll see what goes on over the next few weeks. But within this course, we're going to teach exactly these elements. Now, the course is divided into two parts, parts one and two. Part one is about the foundations and the initial setups. So we're going to kick off with looking at statistics around market structure and how we can gather these in our trading platforms, maybe in some third-party tools as well to make things easier. Each session is going to be somewhere between one hour and two hours, and it's going to be very hands-on so that you can actually understand, follow along, have a little sort of here's how I built it manual and learn how to exploit your tools for this. I very much believe, you know, understand things from first principles, teach a method of going about doing it, show alternative ways of doing it, but transfer the skill so that you're in a position to do this for yourself. So that's going to be the first session, statistics and how to use them. Um, Second session is with these statistics that we gathered last week, Saturday the 16th, How could we look to monetize based upon this set of statistics we're in a position to gather? And then the following week, this is crucial. How can we only take the trade opportunities where we're going to win more than we lose? At what price do we take these opportunities? So trading with a non-arbitrary risk-reward ratio. And then we will wrap up the first part with interactive tutor group, bring whatever questions you need, and we'll go through that. That's the foundations. This is crucial for whatever asset class you're going to trade. This works on options and is very important if you're going to then look to trade stocks, ETFs, or futures, which becomes more advanced. It's much more complicated to trade stocks, ETFs, futures with this kind of approach. And that's where part two comes into play once we have got the foundations in place. So we'll kick off with a bit of statistics and we'll look at how we can exploit this across more asset classes. Then the second week of part two, we're going to look at the volume at price, the order flow statistics, and the statistics around the market structure, market profile. We're going to see what we can identify, how we can go about gathering those statistics. Then we'll look at how we start to combine all this together and how you size your position based upon combinations of events that are happening within the market structure and in the order flow. Then we'll see, let's actually go and build a trading system that has got positive expectancy, a trading system that has got a statistical edge. So we'll see how we can define it. We'll even see how we can automate it for go, no go, and maybe even firing off trades using Sierra charts. The following week, we'll then say, okay, you've come a long way since mid-September. You've learned how to gather the statistics. You've learned how to monetize them across a couple of different asset classes. You learned about unconnected statistics as well. How can you develop this further? What kind of things could you do to build out more setups? How do you apply this to trading evaluators and start to hack some of the evaluations? And then once again, at the end, we'll get into an interactive choose group Q&A. Alongside this, of course, we'll have our community within the trading research group online chat platform, the PIT. So we can have lots of q and I will likely do some ad hoc trading sessions as well for our course students during live markets. And um, we may well add you know, more sessions, recaps, clinics through this schedule as we go on. So this will start on September the 16th. If you're not in trading research group as of today, the course is $12.99 for 10 weeks of education. But if we book before Labor Day, you can save $300 and you can get 10 weeks classes for $999. Alternatively, it might be that you're not sure about this. It appeals, but you don't know if uh, you can cope with my lack of accents or maybe the educational style's not for you. Maybe you just want to dip your toe in the water first of all. So for those people that maybe only trade options, only have an interest in doing that, or just want to de-risk and take it step by step. 
you can join part one on its own. So the twelve ninety nine is a bundle price, but if you so wish and want some flexibility, you can book onto part one now, and then you can book part two later as you go through the course and see if it's for you. So we've got some flexibility there. So you can read more and more about this class, and I've put some FAQ together and a lot more background and a link to some of my educational style. Um, here we go. There's a link here um, that shows you how I teach classes. So you can do your research and your due diligence on this course. You know, take a view if it's for you. You can also reach out to us directly, and I'll be very happy to schedule a call if you like, and we can talk through um, this kind of trading approach and what this looks like. It also includes access to our foundation educational material that's going to explain terminology, the ranges, um, volume at price, really important fundamentals and the, you know, the lexicon, the language that we're going to use. So the URL is there in the chat. Thank you, JVC, for putting that there. So that's at www.tradingresearchgroup.com forward slash events. And you can read all about this upcoming course. So that really is a wrap from my side in terms of taking you through this idea. I'm going to run a few more teaser clinics um, between now and the course start, and we'll dive into different facets of this. So keep an eye on the pit if you're a TRG student or a member, or your inbox or our social feeds, and I'll be providing details of what we're doing between now and the 16th. But feel free now, um, we can unmute you, or you can put any questions you may have in the chat. I'm just going to go through the chat now. See, Peter has said he used Investor RT years ago, and saw that they now have some fandangled, good word, back testing, fandangled, and seen it posted. Not sure what to make of it, but more focused on scalping. One of the good things about this kind of approach, Peter, is there is no, there's no time frame. You know, if we take scalping as an activity where we're looking to enter and exit very quickly, we can still gather data that is relevant based upon short-term ranges. You know, what happens in one-minute ranges? Yeah. What happens in volume at price? What if there is a sweep? How often when there is a sweep in a 15-second bar, does it get resolved during the trading day? How far do we go away from it? Yeah. How, often, how long does it take to get resolved? Once you start to look at things in this way, if whatever products you're trading – you can start to gather statistics and use this to gain an edge based upon what you're doing. This is really about how can we capture the behaviors of what's happening in the markets that we trade or other markets we may not be trading, but maybe more advantageous and use this to get an edge, let alone position size. Anita is asking, how do you get your data? Excellent question. So this is all about how we can leverage the data that's in our existing trading platforms. Uh, I'm a big advocate of Sierra Chart. Um, I will be showing how we can use Sierra Chart and just standard built-in stuff in Sierra Chart to actually get some of this data. Sierra Chart's really powerful for this. I'll also be showing some other tools that you can use um, that leverage the data within your existing trading platform, whether it's Sierra Chart, Ninja Trader, even you know text file, a CSV file um, that contains open, high, low, close data, or even volume at price data. But this is all about leveraging the data that already exists in your trading platform that is used to draw your charts. It's, it's how can we mine that? Yep. But in fact, one of the FAQs in here um is do i need to be a programmer hell no the analytical approaches will work fine using a pen and paper helps if you're comfortable with basic level math and simple excel formulas um but most of the examples will be in sierra chart but you know we'll look at other third-party add-ons as well what about brokerage platforms yeah very possibly jeff it depends on the brokerage platform some i think i think um think or swim actually has the ability to export OHLC data in text files. So for rangers, absolutely, you can start to use those exports as a way of um, assessing stats. You can even, if you want to do it really roughly, you know, pull up a chart in the right time period and do five bar gates on a piece of paper. 
a lot depends about what are the capabilities or restrictions of um, the platform that you're using. But for sure, if you're able to export data from your brokerage platform, depending upon the capabilities of that platform, you will be able to do some statistical analysis on that data. It's really down to how deep does that data go within the platform. But you know, typical equities, ETF options, retail trading platform that can do data exports is going to be able to give you enough raw slash source data to be able to get some stats to certainly look at exploiting this with binaries or options as a minimum. So some good questions there. And you know, actually asking, how do I get data in order to go and mine the data? You know, it's crucial. Um, this isn't about execution. This is about research, hence trading research group. So there's a few questions. Do we have any other questions from anyone else? Right now, I see it's mainly trading research groups, students and members have been asking. We do have a number of guests on here. So please feel free, don't be shy, um, to put any questions in the chat that you may have. Um, Jonathan, Jeff, you know, you're more than welcome as well to unmute and throw in any comments, spears uh, um, into this. And Jonathan, you've been playing this approach for a while now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, th I think you've experienced that by getting your position sizing right based upon the likelihood of what is going to happen or not happen, it's de stress a lot of your trading. Oh, hugely. Uh, uh, where, where uh, you know, just even just a few weeks ago, you know, one or two lot micros, and I, I feel, you know, ah, I don't know, I'm so unsure, and yeah, second guessing, and you know, I start to question things and 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 get all kinds of just torn up and and twisted up in what I'm thinking about, I'm doing, um, and now you know, I can have three, four five lots. I don't usually go over five, but you know, I, I can have as many as five for a little while. And usually that's you know, one to three that I'm holding for the the core move that I know I'm expecting. And I know what the probabilities are around it. And then a couple more that I can scalp little opportunities as they come. And it's, it's been just so ridiculously relaxed. Um, it's, it's really kind of shocking because I'm trading more often and with more contracts, but I'm, way more relaxed is it's it's strange it doesn't really make sense to me when i think about it but at the same time it sort of does because i know what i'm looking for i know what my my frequency of occurrence is on these things and then i know how to understand what's happening in the order flow enough to know whether that supports the idea that i'm looking to do or not and if it supports it then okay we're good you trust I'm, it. I'm, 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 yeah i'm counting cards tangible to lean on <laughs> yeah you know, it's just okay. I'm counting cards. These are the these are the strategy. This is the rules of of the system, and I'm executing those because I know that over the long term, there's positive expectancy here. So, do what I know needs to be done. So, I, th this is so crucial for keeping you know what I like to refer to as the monkey, you know, monkey brain mm. in check because we it's so easy for us to get drawn in by greed and FOMO. Um, oh, yeah. but, you know, we're either trying to impose our will on the market. Or we get spooked and we'll get spooked because we've got too much size on because you know, I'm really trying to make $600 today. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to trade with this size. No, it's going against me. It's going against me. I'd better get out because my open loss is too large. And then the event yeah. plays out. So that's actually yep. a function of incorrect position sizing. Um, so it is really powerful to be able to look at, you know, what what is the value of what's likely to happen? What's the value of my loss? Therefore, based upon what I'm prepared to risk or I'm trying to make versus my available equity, how much do I trade with? It it just puts you in this really solid place by removing a lot of uncertainty. It's mm -hmm. it, it it makes it totally relaxing when you trade. Yeah. And also ideal for a machine to do on your behalf. Yep, absolutely. And and it's always a bad idea to to chase what you want to get out of the market versus what's available to be had. And, you know, and that's just okay. such an easy easy trap to fall into. It's like, "No, but I want this much, you know, $500 a day or we, whatever this arbitrary number I've decided is this is my goal, so I have to just keep pounding away until I get it." And um that you know, that may or may not be, but you might have you might have $5,000 available to you today, you know, who knows, but you don't get to just decide. Here's what I want, so this is what I'm yeah, going to yeah. get. 
doesn't work that way. Yeah. Fun, funnily enough, the markets tend not to do what we want as you know, the list <laughs> of retail strange. traders. So, yeah, that is bizarre, isn't it? It's almost as if the people who have enough volume to move price are looking to take advantage of us being there. They wouldn't do that. You know, we are cannon fodder, but you know, there we go. <laughs> so, good question from Anita. There are so many things that come into play. Volatility, volume, etc., seasonal things. Those, those are all kind of derivations of the same thing. Can you give some examples how to work around these as a non-programmer? Sure. This is about this is about being able to gather statistics quickly, easily, and effectively, and having an understanding of how to use them and compare them. So we might take a view based upon one year's worth of statistics, but I might want to understand how does a rolling three months or this calendar quarter historically compare to the whole year? Maybe the trading range for Q3 is consistently only 80% of the size of the whole year, this kind of thing. So it's about understanding the context and keeping things as relative as you can be um, so that you can keep your statistics, let's say, accurate and tight so that you're suddenly not surprised. And also you start to trade in some quantitative way. Then your job as your general manager of your trading business is actually to see how are my actuals, how are my results relating to my forecast. Yeah. The statistical landscape is my expectation of what's going to occur. But if suddenly I'm starting to drift, you know, am I 20% adrift of what my forecast is? There's your warning flag to look at what might be different. And it might be that you haven't gone fine enough, it could be seasonality. It might be that you lost track of the fact that today was non-farms payroll, yeah? Well, wouldn't it be smart to understand how does the market behave every non-farms payroll day and how is that different to other trading days or FOMC? Or maybe you trade crude. Well, you've got inventories every week, typically on a Wednesday. Are Wednesdays different to other days or when OPEC meetings are on? So it's not about saying that, you know, power of large numbers, you know, on average, everything will be common, but absolutely things like seasonality, things like major news releases, Jackson Hole um, symposium over the past two days and Powell speaking yesterday, we saw a big reaction, something which I shared within um, TRG's community yesterday before Powell's speech was the chart of what happened last year when Powell spoke, just as a little warning, red flag, that if you don't track your economic calendar and you don't stay on top of things, you could easily be spooked as to why on earth has the market gone into price discovery. Well, it's because Powell is speaking at Jackson Hole Symposium. And if you're not aware of the environment, the landscape within which you're trading, and you're just assuming, you know, everything will typically revert to the mean, be normal, then you're going to be surprised. You're going to get burned by these black swan events. But when we have got exceptions that happen regularly, non-farms payroll, FOMC, FOMC minutes, crude inventories, you analyze those as a separate data set and you compare them to the norm. Uh, Bauer is saying blackjack is dependent event game um, each card removed from the deck affects the probability to the next card. Absolutely, provided it's not a continuous shuffler, which is what the casinos implemented, where the it's a full deck, six decks every hand. But you know, traditional shoe dealt game, it is dependent. Um, so each card removed from the deck affects the probability of the next card. Correct. If we say this way of trading is like counting cards, is it also a dependent game? One event increases the probability of the next event. <laughs> Sometimes, Bauer. Yeah? We can look at connections between time-based ranges. So does the behavior of the market and how it traded relative to the overnight range have an effect, for example, on how it trades relative to the first hour's range. 
where the market opens, where the cash opens relative to the overnight futures. If it's in the top 10% of price, does that have an effect? So we can look at some dependencies like that. If it opens in the top 10% but doesn't break the high, then what happens? So we can go as deep as we want, but not every set of events are dependent upon each other. Um, so what I like to do is try to avoid these compound events as much as possible. Why? Um, firstly, there isn't always necessarily an edge. Secondly, you sometimes have to go really, 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 really deep to find correlated events. Um, but my research has shown me I can look at very high frequency, you know, highly occurring events like time-based ranges breaking. It's given me some useful information. I can look at patterns in the volume at price. They give me useful information. And I can combine these unconnected events and still come up with relatively simple two or three inputs trading systems, which combined with proper position sizing, give me long-term positive expectancy without putting too much equity at risk. So you can make your trading based upon dependent or independent events. Uh, the point of this class is let's put in a position to efficiently be able to mine this data and find this stuff and be able to implement and go and explore. But once you have got one or two trade setups, trading systems like this, you're then so much freer to go and explore and research other ideas, which is the beauty of this. Your job becomes doing the research you're like a portfolio manager. Yeah. You're looking to manage a portfolio of trading setups, and your job is to find more and more setups that are better and better. I I liken this to I'm running a team of five or ten traders, each trader being a setup. And I always need to have my talent scouts out there looking for new talent. And if I suddenly find a better trader, trader with better positive expectancy than my weakest one, I'm going to replace them. So we can be researching and refining. Um, Gerald has asked an excellent question. Is the full tick maker course a requirement before joining? It is strongly recommended, I would say required, that you have studied this. But if you, well, you know, the course is 25 bucks, if you're not sure. Yeah. Um, if you sign up to this class, Gerald, we include the Tickmaker course. Yeah. I would hope that people take the time to read and understand it um, and at least be familiar with the terminology of what's what, because I will be using terminology based upon trading ranges of volume at price in part two. And if I use a term like unfinished business in part two, or zero print, um, and somebody goes, what's that? When they've had access to this learning material before the course, um, they're going to get left behind. But the courses are, even if I say so myself, very well written and clear. Um, if you're not certain, you know, sign up to the course for 25 bucks. Um, if you subsequently sign up for this class, I have no issue refunding the 25 bucks because it would have been included anyway. Um, requirements is a good word because I would expect any students of this class, you know, let's treat trading like card counting, to have studied the prerequisite material. Um, you, you've got to be familiar with the terminology and the concepts. So hopefully that answers your question, Gerald. Okay. So as we've gone on for almost, wow, we've gone on for almost 90 minutes. I should have another sip of tea. Um, as we say in Trading Research Group, you know, it's time for our burning desires. So if you have any burning desires, any pressing questions, anything unanswered, um, now is your time to put it in the chat. I'll pause for a couple of minutes and wait for that, wait for input from anyone else. Meanwhile, thank you, everybody, for attending today. I appreciate that. I hope the level and the approach um, was thought-provoking, interesting, maybe even fun. Um, it's very interesting to run the interactive polls and see what people were doing there. So 
as we have put in the chat, you can read more about this class at tradingresearchgroup.com forward slash events. Please keep an eye on our social feeds or TRG PIS if you're in it or email. Um, I will be planning another one or two intro teaser sessions like this over the next few weekends. We'll go a little bit deeper. We'll assume people have you know watched this and understood what's what. Um, or feel free to reach out um, to us at TRG. You can contact me directly um, if you'd like to learn more. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. So thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, Bauer. And everyone, enjoy the rest of your weekends. And uh, TRG members, we will see you at our next live event, which is going to be the Sunday reopen in whew, a day, about a day's time. So thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Bye for now.